Ryzen 7000 custom loop in the Lian Li A4H2O. I'll give you the rundown and let's see what kind of performance you can expect with this custom loop setup. Welcome to Machines and More. This A4H2O build is one that I've been waiting and wanting to do. I was waiting to do this one with Ryzen 7000. In this case, you know, we, we reviewed it about a year ago, but uh, I was waiting for the CPU, I got the CPU, then I had to do some projects with it and had the parts sitting here for quite a while. But yes, finally, Ryzen 7700X and the A4H2O. Big thanks to Bits Power for providing the Summit Pro CPU block for testing and some of the fittings here today. Full disclosure, no money changed hands, but they did provide these parts for this project and for my testing free of charge. Okay, so what's in this? As mentioned, we have the Ryzen 7700X. I tested this chip fairly extensively with the T1 reference edition, and I've been really impressed with it. The block over the CPU is the Summit Pro block, this is a specific AM4, AM5 version. It's pretty heavy, solid chunk. Nickel plated copper cold plate here. Interestingly, the cold plate is not machined smooth. There's some texture here. We'll see just how well this works out shortly. For the motherboard, even though it has a few quirks, I am sticking with the ASUS X670E ITX, mainly for the built-in temp sensor. With this case, uh, I'm not gonna need the add-on card either since the front panel connection only needs the power switch. This board is actually very good, but it's also just very expensive. But uh, I have this one already, so we will stick with it for this build. I am gonna be using my old 3070FE. Some of you have seen this GPU and this block in some other custom loop builds like the Meshlicious. Uh, this one with the EKFE block. And I wanted to use this one because the block is short and that'll give us the clearance that we need for the pump res, which there will be room for next to it. This is the FLT80 DDC from EK with a Xylem DDC 3.2 pump. Fittings are a mix of Bits Power's Touch Aqua compression fittings for soft tubing and their 90 degree fittings with a compression end built in. And I had to throw in a few Alpha Cool fittings to make everything work together. Tubing is Alpha Cool's Alpha Tube HF. This is a flexible solid colored tubing, 10, 16 millimeters. Uh, for the RAD, I'm attempting to fit what I think is one of the best sub 30 millimeter 240s. This is the Hardware Labs GTS 240. Now, technically it's sub 30 millimeters, but it's just at 30 millimeters. And that puts us right at the limit for the A4H2O. Since I am pairing with two of Noctua's NFA 12 by 25s, fit even with the bumpers on the top side of the fans removed is tight. I'm using the RAD gaskets on the side where the fans contact the radiator as well. Finally, the power supply is the SP750 from Lian Li. Build process with this case was mostly fine when it came to the execution. Accessing parts is remarkably easy with how open the system is, but brainstorming and figuring out the layout is the more time consuming part and you definitely want to diagram everything out first and do some test fitting, especially with how the power supply is going to fit in later on. And uh, I did leave that out until the end. I put that back in to that gives me some maneuverability to access the parts. I often run the rat on the outside of the build, but in this particular instance, I chose to put the rat on the inside. The sectioned off rat compartment, with this case, it makes it difficult to access the fittings after it's assembled, so it is really much easier this way. One advantage is also for testing different fans. I've always wanted to, a custom loop system to do that, and this makes it fairly easy to swap out the fans in the future. I also experimented with having the RADS ports on the other end uh, over the motherboard, but uh, the ports, they don't line up properly in that orientation with the cutout on the, uh, for the RAD tray. So the way you see it, it's the only way I could do it with this RAD. Mounting the pump was a little tricky. I thought about that one for a while. There is a spot I could have drilled to screw in the pump, but that's the front panel. and <laughs> It would have looked terrible. You would have seen the screws on the outside. Uh, I could have also drilled and tapped the pump itself and then used the bottom panel, but that also would have been kind of awkward uh, on the removable bottom cover. So what I did was something I don't usually do with the pump res, and that's double-sided tape. What gave me more confidence with this method is that I'm using an extender fitting that connects directly to the GPU block, 
Now it gives a lot of support and also it's resting right against the frame of the unit. So the tape, it's really just giving it some extra security and actually feels pretty good. So I'm confident in doing it this way. Now the pump orientation, it is also a little bit odd. Now it's not strictly uh, prohibited uh, according to the installation manual. In my experience, it's best to have this unit with the fill port facing up and the return port on the bottom. But as long as the res is filled, and the DDC pump isn't at the high point of the loop, it can work. Now it just has to be this way because of the orientation of the GPU. If you're using a longer GPU and GPU block, your pump choices, then they become more limited. Perhaps you will have to go with a combo CPU and pump block, uh, kind of like the one I ran in the T1V2. This pump, it feeds the radiator first. The coolant makes its way over to the other side of the case. A longer horizontal tubing run feeds the CPU block's inlet, and the outlet connects through to the GPU block through tubing right next to the power supply. And then the coolant exits the GPU block and returns to the pump res. I did tweak with the fitting choices a bit to balance out the looks and getting everything to mesh properly within the tight space. Like I mentioned, this case is fairly easy to build in since you can access things from almost every side and even leave the power supply out until the very end. The cable management is okay. I do wish there were a bit more tie down points on the case, but it's also so tight that once you have everything in place, you just have to clean up the cables a bit and bundle them together with a zip tie. The top cover here, it's not quite flush yet. And I attribute that to the screws here. The Hardware Labs RAD, uh, they use an M4 screw and I only had the ones that came with and these aren't exactly low profile. So that will be something for me to work on, but otherwise it's a really easy fix. Filling this loop was probably the easiest part of the build. It was remarkably simple. In fact, one of the quickest fills uh, that I've ever done. It only took about five minutes. Nothing really fancy here with the coolant either. It's just clear excess PC for easy maintenance. I filled with case flat on its side with the pump res facing up. And then I cycled the pump a few times while filling through that port. Then I closed that port and I just shook the case a few times, you know, turned it sideways and then just got the air to collect uh, into the area near the fill port and then turned it upside down to get the air to collect near the fill port and I topped it off. Now this was much, much easier than the T1 V2 mainly because of the use of a pump res in this build. There's about 350 milliliters of coolant in this system. So I did some thermal testings with the fans at 1600 RPM or 75% PWM. With a good radiator like this one, I'm usually comfortable with these fans running at maximum at this level when the system is running hard. The noise profile is super good at this RPM and they definitely can even come down a bit for gaming, but I just kept them there the whole time for the whole duration of the test. When I was testing the CPU with the T1 Reference Edition and the C14S, I had it running with a minus 25 curve optimizer offset and a 110 watt PBT limit. Now with this build, there's more headroom. I felt comfortable doing the same offset, but with a 115 watt PBT limit plus a max 150 megahertz boost. As a result, the CPU holds an all core boost clock of 5.25 gigahertz in equilibrium, and the temps are very manageable. Recall that AMD is comfortable with a chip like this Ryzen 7700X running at around 95 degrees under load. I did test this one without the curve optimizer offset and it doesn't hit that throttle at all. It comes in at about 90 degrees. So overall, this cooling, it's pretty good. Now there's some room to push the clocks a bit more with a manual OC, but I think, you know, as it is right now, it's perfectly fine on PBO2. One interesting fact is that the coolant topped out at 29 degrees for the CPU run. So it was actually pretty low. Uh, so the thermal transfer from the CPU, I think that could be a limiting factor. It's pretty key here at any rate. Uh, the Summit Pro block is doing the job just fine, but this is also the first uh, custom loop block that I've tested with the 7700X. So I'm curious if something like the Optimus Foundation would work uh, better or worse here. Um, and I do have two versions of that one, so I will try and test that later on. For a gaming combined CPU and GPU use scenario, the CPU was holding 5.5 gigahertz on the single core boost. Absolutely no problem, no surprise there. I don't play Far Cry 6 much, but it's actually pretty good for testing the CPU. Even with just the 3070 FE, with the 7700X, I was getting an average of 119 FPS and 109 for the 1% low for the 1440p high setting. That's a very, 
consistent frame time. And interesting because it's slightly faster than the 5800X with a 3080 for this title with way better 1% lows. And that just goes to show how single core limited this title is. But yeah, 7700X is killer for games like this. The attempts are fine, around about uh, 66 on the CPU and 54 on the GPU, which I definitely could lower the fan speeds here while overclocking the GPU a little bit since there's a good amount of headroom here for the card. Many of you will be running this case with an AIO. As the name suggests, H2O is an ideal way for cooling in this case, but I think the custom loop experience was also very, very pleasant. And that little bit of extra space, just over 10 liters, made this build experience much more feasible and very enjoyable. Overall, I'm quite happy with this setup and I am gonna be testing with this one and gaming with it a little bit longer and I'll, we'll have some longer term feedback. So let me know in the comments if you have any questions. The build links are down below. Like, subscribe if you found it helpful. Thanks for watching today.